I want to start today by asking you to do this. Imagine that your thoughts right now were being recorded somehow, and uh, we could play them or we could put them up on the screen, and just ask yourself, how would I feel about that? Now, I, I know at first you're like, ah, you know, like that's scary, and I, I'd feel ashamed or I'd feel embarrassed, and, but if we could take away the embarrassing things or the shameful things, and we could just literally take your life, not, not necessarily put it up on the screen or have other people hear it, but take your life and take the thoughts of your life and just examine them. I think it would actually be really helpful to all of us to be able to hear our own thoughts. Okay? And one of the big things we've been talking about in this series so far is that the Bible invites us to think about what we think about. Okay, think about what you think about. And even right now, I just want you to think, what are some of the patterns that go on in my mind? What are some of the things that I tend to think about? What characterizes my thoughts? Last week I told you we should regularly do a thought audit, right? Look at my thoughts. I was having dinner with my wife a few weeks ago, and uh, we're empty nesters now. We've been empty nesters for a little while, and it's really fun because every night is date night. So I come home from work, and I'm like, Date night again, you know, here I am. You know, so, so we have dinner together and uh, we're, we're enjoying dinner and visiting about our day. And she said to me, she said, do you know what you sound like tonight? And I was like, no. And she said, well, you kind of sound like this. This is bad. And this is, she just repeated my words back to her that I had been saying as we we're enjoying our wonderful dinner together. <laughs> Uh, she said, you, 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 you know, you said, this is bad, and this is bad, and this is bad, and this is bad. And, and honestly, I, as soon as she said, and she said it very friendly, like she's, you know, smiling while she said it. It wasn't like, you know, fight time, you know. There's, sometimes dinner turns into that, right? But this one was a, was a, a friendly uh, chat. And uh, as she said that, um, it just hit me like I had no idea. I really didn't. I didn't even notice my own words and, and the way they were coming across so negatively about my day. And I think that's true for a lot of us about our thoughts. We don't even realize sometimes just how negative and, and how complaining our thoughts can become. Because even if our lives are going decently well, it's amazing how we can zero in on the difficult parts or on the hard things that are part of our lives. And, and that really matters more than we think because what comes into our minds tends to come out in our lives. Right? Our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts, and most of life's battles are won or lost in the mind. And so in our lives, a lot of the outward things we battle with, anxiety or fear or depression or anger or laziness or low motivation, all of these things we're dealing with, a lot of them, if you could trace them back, they're traced back to a thought or a lie that has wrapped its tentacles around our minds. And it's caused us to get, get kind of overcome with those various ways of thinking. In fact, uh, we, we call those ways of thinking strongholds or patterns of thinking. And, and listen, it is impossible. We're going to talk about kind of negative thoughts today, overcoming negative thoughts. It is impossible to have a positive life when your mind is consumed with negative thoughts. Now, good news about that is you don't have to just live with that and think, yeah, it's hard. You know, my thoughts are, you know, so bad and it's so hard. You know, you can, you can overcome. You don't have to be a victim to your thoughts. Uh, the, God has given us weapons, primarily his word, the word of God, by the spirit of God that we can use to demolish strongholds, right? And I love how it says it, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. It says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought. Make it obedient to Christ, right? It's like you're a thought warrior, okay? And you, you, this is what we're trying to become over these weeks of this series. And if you've missed some of the other weeks, I would encourage you to go back and get those and, and listen to those because we're learning to be thought warriors. Why don't you say this with me? Say, I am a thought warrior. You did pretty good with that. Okay, we're going to say it, but just with a little more confidence, okay? I am a thought warrior. Whoa, that was awesome. Okay, ready? Let's, let's keep going. I take captive every thought. I take captive every thought. And I make it obedient to Christ. And I make it obedient to Christ. Yeah. Man, you guys, give yourself a hand. You did really good there. That was awesome. Awesome. So that's exactly what we are learning to do. Romans 12, 2 puts it this way. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, 
but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So you notice there's patterns of thinking, right? That's, that's uh, we're learning there's neurological pathways. So every time you think a thought, that there's a neural pathway that gets formed in your brain. In other words, every time you think a thought, it's easier to think that thought again because that thought travels a little path in your brain. And we found out one of the most exciting discoveries in science in the last 20, 30 years is what they call neuroplasticity, that, that your, your brain can continue to grow. You can continue to get, uh, uh, learn new things and, and, and develop your brain. You can, you can actually uh, change some of the grooves that have already been formed in your patterns of thinking. Right? It's a pretty cool reality. So we're learning to do that in a biblical or in a godly way, not to conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, you know, think new thoughts, and, and uh, create some new grooves in our lives. Um, so I'm going to add a layer to that for us today. Okay, so we're going to like do advanced war technique today in our thought battle. Okay, so we're going to add a layer. So you guys ready for kind of the, this is the heavy stuff. Here we go. Okay, we're going to talk about something. We're going to name it differently as we go through this. But I want to start by calling it a cognitive bias. Okay, we're going to talk about cognitive bias. So a cognitive bias, um, some people call it a mental filter. It's a mistake in reasoning based on personal experiences or preferences. Okay, so it's, it's, it's when we look at things, but we're not quite seeing them right because we have a bias or like a, a filter over our view of them. So we don't see the situation accurately. We don't see it rightly. Have you ever been in a, in a situation where you were, you were in a room or in a place or with a person and the colors just seemed off? And you were like, oh, I wonder if they're sick or something today. Their color seems wrong or this room seems so dark. And then suddenly you realize you're, you're wearing sunglasses. <laughs> Has that ever happened to anybody? And you're like, oh, oh yeah. Uh, lift up your seat. You're like, okay, that's better. They're not actually sick. You know, this room isn't actually as dark as it seemed. I was just wearing sunglasses, right? It's just, it's, it's like we're looking through a lens or we're looking through a filter. Or, or have you ever done uh, the FaceTime where you can play with the, the filters? You ever done that? Or you can play with the, so you, you got to try this sometime. You can go on uh, FaceTime and you can, <laughs> You can click on, yeah, and you can, you can do all kinds of crazy things because it, it bends and warps, right? And uh, I actually thought we could try it here today. Can we do a FaceTime call? We're going to call our church right now. We'll be on a FaceTime call. Here I am, and there I am. Yeah, so we got a couple filters going on there, right? We've got a, a little distortion, and then we've got a dinosaur filter. All right, so here's the deal with these filters is that uh, I look like a dinosaur, but I'm not a dinosaur because, right, the filter is messing with it. Let me see if I can try some other ones here. Just, yeah, look at that. Isn't that nice? Or that one. Oh, yeah, there we go. Or this one's a little scary, right? So anyway. <laughs> oh. Okay, we'll, we'll stop because it <laughs> just gets, it gets crazier and crazier the longer you go. And now we're going to get so distracted, you won't even know what we're talking about anymore. So we'll come up. <laughs> but how many of you love our media team? Don't they do a great job? Yeah, they do. And, you know, it's so fun. I'll, I'll ask them, like, do you think we could pull this off? And they're like, oh, yeah, we can do that. You know, and they, they figure it out and make it happen and uh, love that. So here's what a filter does. A filter bends or distorts what something looks like like. And, and oftentimes, we don't even realize it's happening. Obviously, on that FaceTime one, it's really obvious, right? But many times in our lives, we can't even see it because of our own bias. We're not even aware that we're looking through that kind of filter. And a lot of times, it just comes from how we grew up, the things we were taught or the experiences we had. If you grew up in a home where there was a lot of chaos, fighting, um, uh, anger, all of that kind of stuff, maybe your parents ended up divorced, right? It can... You can bring that view into your marriage or even into just your life. You can sort of think, uh, uh, man, I don't even know if I want to get married, right? If that's, if that's the way things are, because you've got a filter that's, that's biasing you in a certain direction. Or maybe you were hurt by someone. Maybe there was a, a man in your life who was uh, uh, hurtful in your life. And then you sort of get this lens towards all men. You bias yourself towards them all. Or a woman who betrayed you in your life, and then you have a lens that expands that, 
right? Uh, actually, in those kind of areas well, where we talk about that, and we're going to, you know, I want, I want you to see different kinds of filters or biases. This is a particular one. But in that kind, where, where it's a certain kind of person, and then we expand it beyond that, you know the word we use for that? We call it a prejudice, right? A prejudice. Just means that we, we're seeing people, or especially a certain kind of people, through a lens. And it's distorting our view. Okay, um, let me give you other examples though, because I don't want you to get stuck on any given one kind. Maybe you grew up with parents who told you bad things about wealthy people. So this happens quite a bit. People grow up in homes where, where they're kind of taught, oh, wealthy people, those people are greedy, those people are corrupt, they've probably done something wrong, you know, to, to be able to have that kind of money. Those are, those are bad people. And if you grew up with, with a filter like that, and then later on in your life you become successful financially, you can almost feel guilty, right? You almost feel like, oh, there must be something wrong with me. I must be bad. There's actually, people will self-sabotage their own success unknowingly. They're not even aware of it to keep from that, that particular one. That's a pretty significant one in a lot of people's lives. Um, here, here's maybe a more obvious one. Maybe you were bitten by a dog when you were younger, Right? And so now you just kind of think all dogs are like that. Dogs are just mean and aggressive. They're out to get you. And that's, you know, you just, you can't see dogs any other way. When in reality, it's cats that are like that, right? <laughs> you all know this? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I have somebody on my side there. Clearly, I have some biases too. Okay. So those of you who see it the other way, that's okay. Uh, but uh, uh, this is the, the key to this is that a filter causes two people to go through the exact same situation, the exact same thing, but they have two totally different experiences out of it. In other words, they see it two different ways. The facts are the same, but the perspective is different because the filter is different. You can have two people go to work, have the same talk with the same boss, right? And the boss says, you, you need to work on these three things. You got to fix this. You know, this is, this is not working. And one person can say, man, I can't believe my boss hates me can't believe they, they just, uh, I hate, they don't appreciate me at this job and I'm probably going to get fired. I hate this job. I got to go find somewhere else. Another person can have the exact same conversation and say, man, I can't believe how much they value me around there, right? They want me to improve. They think I'm going to get better. I'm probably going to get promoted, right? Same conversation, totally different perspective on the conversation. Uh, one of the greatest examples of this in the Bible is when the people of Israel are on the cusp of the promised land, they're about to go in and Moses sends in 12 spies to check out the land. These 12 spies have the same exact experience. They see the same things. They, they go the same places. They walk the exact same ground. But when they come back, there's two totally different reports. Caleb and Joshua, two of the spies, they say, land is beautiful. This is great. We're going to love it. And guys, we are well able. God is with us and God is for us. And we're going we're, we're gonna, to uh, eat the bread is the way they say it. We're going to devour this land like bread. Flip that around, 10 of the spies, they say, oh yeah, the land is good. Oh yeah, it's a beautiful place, but it's going to devour us. That land devours people. And in verse 33 of Numbers 13, they say, we even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. Right? That, that's how they saw us, which is fascinating to me because I'm pretty sure those 10 spies never had an interview with the giants, right? How did they know that's what the giants saw them like? It's not like they sat down with the giants and said, how do you see us? And the giants said, ah, oh, we see you as a bunch of grasshoppers, right? Or however giants speak. I don't know what giants sound like, but, you know, so that, that didn't happen, right? Why did they think the grasshoppers saw them that way? Or the grasshoppers, the giants. The giants saw them as grasshoppers. Well, because that's how they saw themselves. They thought of themselves as weak and helpless in front of these guys. So they assumed everybody else saw them that way too. It was a mental filter. It was a bias. It was a perception, okay? So... We need to change our filters or our frames uh, so that we can see things the right way or a healthier way. Or let me say it this way, because this isn't just positive thinking, okay? What we want to do is we want to learn to see life from God's perspective. Because when you see life from God's perspective, you're seeing it rightly. You're seeing it the, the, the true way, the real way. 
And, and the reality, again, is all of us go through life with filters, with biases. We're not seeing things as they really are. And that's why we need God's wisdom. We need God's word to bring us to his way of seeing the world because his way of seeing the world is the way it actually is. Okay? So uh, uh, I call that reframing. Okay? Reframing. Taking whatever it is in your life, your circumstances, your experiences, and framing them uh, with, with God in the picture. So, so uh, let's, let's just use an example of this picture for framing. Here we have a picture of most of our daily lives. Most of our lives have some storms in them, right? Some negative things, some difficult things, and then uh, some beautiful things in them, some, some lovely, nice parts of our lives. Now, you can wake up in the morning, and you can frame your life around the storm, right? You can frame your life and just go, oh, man, this is probably going to be a terrible day. I, I got all these difficult things I'm going to face. I got all these problems I'm going to face. Man, I'm tired. There's not enough of me to go around. I'm so exhausted. I don't know why I have to face all this stuff, right? My boss is such a tyrant. My coworkers, oh, I hate working with those guys, right? They're always bugging me. You know, you, you get in your car to go to work. You say, I hate this car, this old clunker, piece of junk, why do I have to drive this stupid car, right? It's just going to be a terrible day. Now, you can take that exact same day, right, all the same stuff, and you can frame it differently. You can wake up in the morning and say, man, I got a lot to do today. Boy, that's good. I, I'm probably going to get a lot done. Right? God is with me. God is for me. There's good things ahead for me. I get, to, I, I get to go to work. I don't love my job, but hey, I have a job. Woo, right? My boss is kind of a tyrant. Maybe I can make a difference. I don't know, you know. I don't know. I'm, more, I'm trying here, okay? I'm trying. You know, my coworkers are kind of a pain, but it grows my character, <laughs> right? Or more realistically, you get in that car, and honestly, I think you could think this. This old clunker has gotten me a long ways. Boy, look at all the miles we put on this thing. I'm sure thankful it's still going, right? You can think of things to frame your day differently. Okay? And, and that reframing really can make a difference. I, we can't always control what happens to us, but we can control how we choose to frame it. And the Apostle Paul is a master at this. That guy went through some of the darkest and most difficult places in life, and yet he was able to frame it in redemptive ways. He was able to frame his life from God's perspective. And the book of Philippians is one of the great places where we see this happen. The book of Philippians is known as a book on joy. Right near the beginning of the book, he says this in verse 12 of chapter 1, I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, so he's writing to the Philippian church, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. So what I want you to notice is that word here. Where is Paul at the time of writing this? Well, you know where Paul is? He's in prison in Rome. He's chained to the palace guard. And he's writing to the Philippians, and he's, he's, they know where he is too. But he wants them to know, you guys don't have to worry about me. You know, he could have written this exactly the opposite. He could have said, I want you guys to know about how I'm doing here with where I'm at. My life sucks. Like, I'm in jail. This is really rough. He could have listed off all the problems, all the pains, all the difficulties, all the darkness. Right? He could have concluded it with something like, and you know what? With all of that, I quit. <laughs> Would have been the last verse of Philippians, right? Philippians 1.12, the end. I quit. Right? Hey, you know what else is fascinating about this verse? Uh, Paul had prayed and prayed and prayed to be able to go to Rome. That was his dream. He wanted to go to Rome and preach the gospel in Rome because Rome was the most influential city in the world at that time. It's a powerful place. And so Paul was always dreaming of getting to Rome. And Paul ended up getting to Rome, but totally not how he thought. He went to Rome as a prisoner. You ever have situations in your life that don't turn out like you had hoped or like you wanted? Anybody else have things like that in your life? And, and you kind of think, well, here I am, but this is not how I thought it would turn out. This is not how I hoped it would be. That's certainly where Paul was at in this situation. But he knew how to frame it. And, and notice that he says everything, right? My dear brothers and sisters, everything has happened to me here to help spread the good news. Everything means a lot of things. He's talking about bad things and good things. And so he's just saying God is, is, is doing something good. God is turning 
this negative situation for good. The, the next verse says this, everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. Well, <laughs> The palace guard, they're known as the Praetorian guard. These were the elite of the elite in that day of the military. They were the very top military people in the entire world at that time, the Praetorian guard. Augustus Caesar, one scholar says, instituted this group. It formed the emperor's private bodyguard. Uh, it became known as the kingmakers because they themselves later on appointed Caesar. As Rome conquered the nations of the world, these were the men who were appointed to rule over them. This band of men were very strategic in the Roman Empire. And here's, you know what Paul's saying? He's saying, I've been chained to the most influential guys in the most influential house, in the most influential city in the entire world. Who's the prisoners here, right? I get to preach the gospel to all these guys. I get to share with them. Some scholars think that there was upwards of about 4,000 of the Praetorian Guard that Paul preached the gospel to during that time in his life. He was chained to these guys eight hours a day, and they would change uh, shifts every eight hours. And Paul would just preach the gospel to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. At the end of the book of Philippians, he's giving greetings and he says, and some of the members of Caesar's own household, again, this is the highest household in the entire world at the time, who are followers of Jesus, they also want to greet you, Philippian church. And most of us believe that the, those believers in Caesar's own household were led to Christ by the apostle Paul while he was chained to the guard of the house of Caesar himself. Are you kidding me? Right? So God, Paul is just saying, look what God is like. Look, if you have eyes to see it, what looks like the worst thing ever, what looks like the opposite of what I had hoped for and dreamed for, if you have eyes to see it, you can see God is at work. Look at the next verse. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. Again, you could flip that verse exactly the opposite. Paul could have said, and because of my persecution and because things are so bad, the whole church has gone into hiding. It's probably going to cause the church to just disappear and get squelched out and hide out. Man, this persecution's terrible. Right? And honestly, I mean, I, I hear that's kind of talk to this day. People griping, complaining about all the situations. Listen, guys, we have a God who uses the situations we're in for good, right? And so Paul's just going, look, look at the boldness this is going to create in the church. It is true that some are preaching Christ out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach Christ with pure motives. And he goes on to talk about that, how some of the people around him are preaching Jesus for the wrong reasons and trying to get Paul in more trouble and so on. And he says this at the end of it in verse 18, but that doesn't matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way. So I rejoice and I will continue to rejoice. And actually through the whole rest of the book of Philippians, Paul's rejoicing and he's encouraging rejoicing even in the darkness, even in the trial, even in the pain. Why? Because he's chosen how to frame his situation, to see it from heaven's perspective to see the good, to see what God is up to. So when you find yourself in circumstances that are difficult, and you will, you are, because you're human in a broken and fallen world, you can reframe. So let me give you three keys to reframing uh, quickly here. The first one is gratefulness. Gratefulness, and I, I wanna say this this way, you can thank God even for what didn't happen. You know that, right? Because even when there's bad things, it can always be worse. Isn't that true? And it's actually one of the ways that you can reframe your situation. It's just be thankful for even, even the things that don't happen. Actually, part of the perspective of grace is that we don't deserve anything anyway, right? Like if we got what we deserved, we'd all be in way worse shape than we are. So things could always be worse. Now, there's a story that illustrates this, a 20-year-old girl, uh, she's in university, and she sees her parents every few months, she meets her parents this one day, and she says, Mom, Dad, I've got some bad news for you, I need you to sit down. So they sit down, and she says, a few weeks ago, university was just so overwhelming, I, I, I went to the bar, and I, I got totally drunk, I hooked up with a guy, went back to my apartment, she says, man, I found out a few days later, I was pregnant, I'm going to have a baby. And she says, but don't worry, mom and dad, I, 
His, his probation is going to be over in a year. <laughs> Once my boyfriend gets out of rehab, he says he's going to start looking for a job. He told me he loves me. He wants to get married one day. Well, we can't afford it right now. So he's just going to move in and we'll live together. And then she just lets that hang in the air for a minute and then she says, actually, just kidding. None of that ever really happened. But I do want you to know I got a D on a chemistry exam. And I just wanted to put things in perspective, right? It can always be worse, right? It could always, right? It could always be worse. You know what? The honest truth is, that is true for us, isn't it? I mean, you get in a car accident, you're upset, the car smashed up, you got to deal with insurance, all of that, but you thank God no one was hurt, right? There's things to thank God for. Or, or uh, you, you end up at work one day and you, things don't go well, you end up missing out on a bonus or the economy's gone crazy and you thank God you still have a job, right? You go, well, it could be worse. You go to a doctor's appointment, what you wish was true about your health, you find out the opposite. You get bad news. But at the same time, you can thank God you're still alive. You can thank God for each day that you do have, right? So there's, there's always a way to frame that gratefulness piece. Uh, the second thing that I would say you can do if you want to get better at reframing is to practice pre-framing, okay? Practice pre-framing. So practicing pre-framing just helps you build the muscle of reframing. Pre-framing is just taking anything that's coming your way and reminding yourself to frame it with the lens of God in the picture, okay? Or to, to frame it positively, right? So just like we said about the day, right? I can frame my day positively or I can frame it negatively. I can wake up in the morning and think about the, the good things or the negative things. Uh, you can do this with all kinds of things that are coming your way. An example in my own life that I always have to work at is when I have meetings coming up. I often get emails or messages from our, our uh, administrators and so forth that so-and-so wants to meet with you or so-and-so set up an appointment with you or uh, so-and-so would, would like to connect with you. And so then I, I can think of all, I can allow my mind to go in two very different directions. I can think of all the negative reasons why a person would want to meet with me, right? I can think, oh man, they're probably mad about something. Oh, maybe they're leaving the church. Oh, right. Oh, they're probably going to criticize does any of you ever have that? Roll, roll through your mind about a, a meeting coming up or a thing coming up and you can go down the negative path? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm capable of that. And I have to actually stop and pre-frame my meetings, my get-togethers, whatever they are, church services, whatever I'm doing. And, and just say, no, you know what? God's good. God's with me. He's giving us wisdom. Even if I know there's even difficult things coming in a, in a conversation or whatever, I can pre-frame it positively. Say, this is going to work out well. Right? So uh, that's one that I have to work on. But that's exactly what Paul is doing in his situation. And then the third thing you can do is you can look for God's goodness in everything you do. Just look for God's goodness in everything. Because what you are looking for, that is exactly what you will find. Okay? If you look for the good, you'll find the good. If you look for the bad, you will find the bad. Uh, if you look for hope or grace or strength or opportunity, you'll find it. You'll find it. Uh, Craig Rochelle says this, he says it this way, he says, this is the difference between a, a, a vulture and a hummingbird. <laughs> a vulture is looking for dead things, and guess what a vulture finds? Dead things. A hummingbird is looking for sweet things, and a hummingbird finds sweet things. Same day, but they find two totally different things because you look, you find what you're looking for. For. And your view of the goodness of God, church, is such a big deal. It's one of the main things the enemy will try to steal from you or lie to you about. It's this view of God's goodness. Actually, in my second year of Bible college, I graduated from Bible college, second year, and one of my buddies, his name is Guy Warner. He's from England. And Guy came up to me at the end of Bible college and he said, Danny, what did you learn out of two years of Bible college together? What did you learn? And I was like, oh, that's a big question. I tried to come up with something and I totally forget whatever it was that I said. I looked back at him. I was like, Guy, what about you? What did you learn in two years of Bible college? And he was ready. You know, he was kind of hoping I would ask that, right? He was like asking me, so I would ask him. And so, what did you learn? And he looked right back at me and he said, I learned that God is good. Two years of Bible college and I learned that God is good. And man, ever since then, that was 20 some years ago, I've always thought of that conversation. And I've always thought, you know what? If you spent two years of Bible college and the one thing you got out of it was that God is unshakably good, 
He's thoroughly good from beginning to end. And that nothing can steal that from you. That is money well spent, time well spent to get that rooted in your heart and to live your life through the lens of reality. Because reality is the goodness of God, the love of God, the power of God in the midst of whatever you are going through. We're not interpreting the goodness of God through our circumstances. We are interpreting our circumstances through the lens of the goodness of God of God. One of the best places you can go for this in the Bible is the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms, this is what the psalmist is fighting to do in Psalm after Psalm. He's just fighting to get, to, he's like going through trials, going through difficulties. Walter Brueggemann is a theologian. He says this, Psalms are, are orientation, disorientation, reorientation. Okay, the Psalms go through those three steps. Orientation, disorientation, reorientation. So orientation is life is good. Disorientation is life is chaotic. So the psalmist describes their troubles. Reorientation is God, help me see my life through the lens of your goodness. And you see this in psalm after psalm. By the end of the psalm, the psalmist is rejoicing in the Lord, is praising God, has a great perspective of faith and the goodness of God. It says, man, I'm going to see God's goodness in my life. Their circumstances haven't changed, but by the end of the psalm, their perspective has. You see that in Psalm 23 where the psalmist starts the psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. And then he goes through the valley of the shadow of death and he says, but God's with me. God's taking care of me. My cup is, because of that, my cup is overflowing. God's setting a table for me in the presence of my enemy. And he ends the psalm this way. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Man, when I'm in God, my best days are always ahead of me. And today, goodness and mercy are going to be following me around. Not troubles. You know, sometimes we get that. Trouble just follows me. Right? I just have bad luck. Right? He goes, goodness follows me. Mercy follows me. Because God is my shepherd in my life. That's his perspective. One more person, and then we're going to close. But one more person. I want to just bring this out, out, out for you. Joseph. In the Bible, Joseph was betrayed by his brothers and sold into slavery. He was falsely accused. He was thrown into prison. He was forgotten and left for dead there. Joseph's life just seems like one bad thing after another happens to him. And yet through it all, you can trace the hand of God. Over and over again, one of the themes in Joseph's story is that God was with him even in those dark places, even in those difficult places. And really, you know, I I, I really think for some of us, we've been through stuff like that. And Joseph's pain, a lot of it came even from his earlier years. I couldn't help but think as I was preparing this message, for a lot of us, a lot of those frames have come in our early years of life where there's been painful things. And Joseph is just such a classic example of how God can even take those painful things, those wounds, those hurts from your past, and he can turn them for good. Look how Joseph names his children. This is later on in his life. This is Genesis 41. Joseph called the name of the firstborn, his firstborn child, Manasseh, for God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. The abuse he experienced, God healed that, and he wanted to declare that. And the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has called me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Oh my goodness, right? Even though I'm still going through hard things, even though I've still experienced pain and difficulty uh, along the way, God has actually turned that into fruitfulness, right? He's used it as as fertilizer for growth in my life. And in the the end there, in his story, Genesis chapter 50, Joseph is confronted with his own brothers who caused his pain, right? Right? And look what he says to them. He says, don't you see? He's trying to give them a new frame, a new perspective. Don't you see? You planned evil against me. And it really was evil, what they did. And when you think about the pain in your past, I'm not trying to tell you that it wasn't evil. You know, that somehow you can just think of your pain as good. It wasn't good. But God is so good that he can even take those evil things, those painful things. And look what Joseph says. God used those same plans for my good 
as you will see all around you right now, life for many people. In other words, God used them for Joseph's good and God used it for the good of others as Joseph put his pain in the hands of a good God and put his situation, his affliction into the hands of a good God. Isn't that awesome? That's what our God can do. And that's why when you follow Jesus, reframing isn't just positive thinking. It's more than that. It's better than that. It's inviting the living God into your reality. Why don't we stand together? We'll close in prayer. Father, I thank you that you are the God who, who is entirely good. You're a God who loves us. You're the God who it says in Romans 8, 28, God works all things together for my good, for our good, for the good of those who love you and are called according to his purpose. Lord, thank you that you are a God who's with us and for us. And Lord, we've battled with perspectives. We've battled with our framing. We've battled with trials. Lord, it's so easy to turn negative. It's so easy to allow uh, resentment and hurt to affect us, even to spoil our, our, our perspective, to bias us. Holy Spirit, would you come even right now and just do a healing work in our hearts? Give us a, a biblical frame a godly frame. Help us see life through the lens of your grace, of your goodness, of your love, of your faithfulness, of your presence. You know, one thing I want to pray for here today is just if you're here and you would say, I've got pain in my past that I just want to ask God to redeem today. I want to just pray for you. Pray that God will take that and redeem it in some way. Or maybe it's something that's currently in your reality, just a difficult thing. You're just saying, God, I can't see it, how, how you can do it, but I want you to redeem it. You know, this, when we're talking about reframing, you don't necessarily even have to see it now. You have to be willing to take the hand of God in the midst of it. So if that's you today, and you just, pain either in your past or present, and you just say, God, would you redeem it today? Would you just lift up your hand? Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for all those today who are inviting you into the frame. Thank you that you are light. Thank you that you are hope. And God, as you come into the frame of our difficulties, of our pains, of our past, Lord, you bring redemption. Lord Jesus, you bring life. Father, you turn what was meant for evil into good. God, you take those difficult situations and you comfort us and strengthen us in them. Lord, you come beside us. You strengthen our relationship with you. You grow our character. Father God, you make those areas of weakness into strengths. And Lord, even beyond that, you can take those areas and make them a blessing not only in our lives, but a blessing to others beyond us. It ripples out to influence others. I pray you would do that today in Jesus' name. And then just one other thing I want to pray for. If you're here and you would say, I, I, I'd like to get to know God better. I'd like a relationship with him. You know, Christianity is not a religion where you follow a set of rules and then hope you make it into heaven. Christianity is really is a relationship with the living God. And if you're not sure you have a relationship with God, man, the, the greatest decision you can make in your life is just to respond to God's open invitation to come to him. God knew that we couldn't get to him, and so he came to us in Christ. That's why Jesus came to this world, lived a perfect life, and then he died on the cross to pay for your sins and my sins. And the, the whole reason Jesus did that was to be able to offer you forgiveness and a restored relationship with God. And so the way you receive that, the way you embrace a relationship with God is not by earning your way there. It's not by doing enough good deeds or by deserving it somehow. The way you receive a relationship with God is you come empty-handed. You come a sinner. You come broken. And you just say, okay, Lord, I'll receive what you offer. For, please forgive me. Let what you did for the sins of the whole world on the cross, let it be applied to my soul. Forgive me of my sins. You make it personal. The promises of God only become powerful when you make them personal, when you make them your own. And so today, if you're here either online or here in person, and you just say, you know what, I'd like to do that right now. Just like I prayed for people a minute ago, I want to pray for you as well. Maybe we could just bow our heads, close our eyes, so this is between people and God. But 
If you're here and you want to say, yes, today's my day. I want to step into a relationship with God. Would you just slip up your hand? Just lift up your hand. Yeah, got a few there. Another one there. Another one there. Awesome. Anybody else? You just say yes. Yes. Another one there. So good, you guys. We're going to pray a prayer together. We're all going to pray it. Those of you who lifted your hand or think you, you know, wish I wish I would have lifted my hand. I really want this. You just pray this. Mean it with all your heart. Let's believe that God will do a miracle in your heart today. Bring you into that relationship. That's the beginning. So let's pray this together. Lord Jesus, I come to you and I need a Savior. I want you to forgive my sins. Let what you did on the cross for the whole world be applied to my life. Thank you for calling me. Thank you for loving me. You gave your life for me. Now I give my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's give God a hand. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. So cool, you guys.